Okay. So, now that you all are all fueled up, we, I got about 15, 20 minutes left before the sugar <laughs> crash happens after, although they don't have anything with sugar in it now at lunch. So, all right. So, yeah, I, I've created my own new energy drink. No. <laughs> It's 50% Monster, the other 50% Geritol. And so, uh, Geritol is a uh, supplement for old people. And so, <laughs> you know, it just kind of helps give old people, replenish all the stuff, and so, kind of a little bit of both. Well, I do better in school. Yeah. Will you? If I take it. Take Geritol? No. No, take your... Oh, no. Just, yeah, just, you can go straight Monster. <laughs> You're young, you can handle it. See, old people, they, that, that, see, you guys don't even know the old people stuff. Okay? All right. So, empirical formulas and molecular formulas. Again, this is going to be an I. There we go. Yeah, it's always going to be in your Every time I say that, everybody. Okay? So, empirical formula. The empirical formula is the simplest ratio. Of the elements in a compound. So we could have examples NaCl, MgCl2, Al2, SO4, 3. Now remember the polyatomic ions, they act like one thing. So this is 3 SO4, so it's a 2 to 3 ratio. It's the simplest ratio. But even co covalent compounds might be described with an empirical formula, but we still are going to call it a molecular formula. It's the formula of the molecule. Now again, ionic compounds, the reason why we have to use empirical formulas is because they form these large crystals. Ionic compounds don't form an individual unit. There's no such thing as NaCl, just a, a molecule of that. When you dissolve salt into water, like in the ocean, or if you have contacts like a saline solution, or if you're going to make spaghetti noodles, you just put some salt in the water. Okay? Then the Na plus breaks apart from the Cl minus, and Na plus is surrounded by the water. Cl minus is surrounded by the water. You don't have any NaCls floating around. You have ions floating around. Okay? So there's never an uh, individual NaCl. Ionic compounds don't form molecules. In the solid state, they're, they're big, huge crystals, one ion surrounded by the other. And then in solution, or if you melt them, you're just breaking the ions apart from one another. So there's, there's never an NaCl. So we, all we can do is just give the simplest ratio. But for a covalent compound, okay, molecular formulas describe the actual molecule <coughs> as it exists in nature. It does not different color all caps. It does not have to be the simplest ratio. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. So examples of it would be C6. H12O6. And do we know what the name of that is? Glucose. That's glucose. Now it's actually, there are a bunch of different isomers of this. Fructose is, is, a, is just a different arrangement. It's still C6H12O6. It's just a slightly different arrangement of it. Okay? Um, dextrose. Sucrose is, is two of these together. Sucrose is C12H22O11. 
I don't know if you learned in biology, maybe even learned with Graeber about uh, a dehydration polymerization. That sounds pretty fancy. Dehydration polymerization. So dehydration means take away the water. Dehydrated. You're dehydrated. You need to drink more water. So the dehydration part means you remove a water. Polymerization means you're polymers, you're putting more mers together, okay? And so um, when you do that, then you put two of these together and you make a dimer, two mers, of C12H22O11. Notice the difference between that is two hydrogens and one oxygen because you take a water out as you link the two together. An OH from one of these combines with an H from the other one makes the water and then that links the two together. So the difference between sucrose and glucose is glucose is a monomer, sucrose is a dimer. All right, And your body has to break, break the sucrose down into glucose for it to use it. Okay? So uh, that, but that's that octane, what do you put in your gas tank? C10, C8H18. That's octane. Okay? Um, what would be another one that would not be reduced? Um, uh, hydrazine, which is a fuel for, for uh, rockets, is N2H4. So it doesn't have to be, it's however the molecule exists in nature. Now we could, H2O, CO2, those are still molecular formulas because that's the way the molecule exists. But they are the simplest ratios, so it's an empirical and a molecular formula both. Does that make sense? Are you with me? All right. So. We should be able to tell the difference between ionic compound and a covalent compound just by looking at the first thing. If it's a metal, it's ionic. If it's a non-metal, it's covalent. So then we know that ionic compounds, we're just going to use the empirical formula to describe them. A covalent compound would use the molecular formula. Okay? Now, most of the time, though, we go through and we just kind of treat. Um, when we want to calculate the molecular mass, it's not going to be any different between ionic and covalent. We're going to calculate it the same way. Uh, we're just going to call it the molecular mass versus the formula mass, and the, the, together we're going to call it the molar mass. Okay, so the molar mass. So, so now we're going to go to uh, E, calculating calculating the molar mass. Compounds. Now again, this is total review. We know how to do this. Okay? But it just want, I, I just don't want to make any assumptions. We can spend 10 minutes just make sure that everybody has it. We remember how to do it. And so uh, just bear with me on the simplicity here. Okay, now again, just off to the side. Off to the side, we can know that molar mass is an umbrella term for three more specific terms. For an element, we're going to actually call it the atomic mass. Okay? For a ionic compound, we call it the formula mass. And for a covalent compound, we call it the molecular mass. Okay? So specifically, for an element, the smallest part is an atom, so we call it the atomic mass. For a covalent compound, the smallest part is a molecule, so we call it the molecular mass. But for an ionic compound, we don't really have a molecule, but we have the simplest formula, the empirical formula, so we just call it the formula mass. And then they even make it a little bit more specific to make sure it's not AMUs versus grams. Sometimes they'll put gram atomic mass, gram formula mass, meaning you're just going to calculate it in grams, which is what we're pretty much, it's the same number, it's just what unit you're going to put on it. Okay? So 
Uh, I just use the term molar mass as an umbrella that covers everything. Okay, the molar mass. But these are just specific terms for that. We've already calculated, we know how we calculate the average atomic mass, get the red number, but now for a compound, how do we use that to get the actual mass of, of the compound? Okay, and we know this, so example, let's just take our C6H12O6. What's the, how are we going to do the molar mass? And by the way, MM is my molar mass. And I made it like mountains, my M's. So it doesn't look, so you can differentiate between a lowercase. I know, just work around this, but I, I had to have this set up ahead of time. I, there's nowhere to put it. How do I calculate the molar mass of this? Okay. Okay, keep, give me specifically. What do I need to go? Okay, so, so what do I do with this six? Okay, now I'm going to be real specific here, and I'm going to put units and all that in it, which you really don't have to do but I'm just going to kind of show you. that This represents in one mole of glucose, we're going to have six moles of carbon. Times what? What do I times that to by? The mass of one mole of carbon atoms, which is 12.011. Okay? Now, we're going to use at least three sig figs Generally, the rule is whatever you're given is to say they gave you 15.04 grams of glucose, well, then you're going to want to use four sig figs on your molar mass, 12.01. Okay? You, always, you don't want your molar mass to be the sig fig limiter. Because we have it to many more places, use the, at least the number of sig figs. Three is always the minimum. So we don't want to say 12. We could say 12.0. Let's go ahead and say 12.01. Okay? So 12.01, and that's grams per mole. Then what? Plus 12 moles times, okay? So hydrogen is it was one, if it's what you kind of learned as, but if you look, it's, it's 1.0078, so 1.01 grams per mole plus times 16.0, it's 15.9994, that's going to go to 16.0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so then we just add all those up, and it comes out to 180, it's going to be 0 0.06, that's like 0 0.16, something like that. Okay, I'm going to do it. Get the exact. Four digits. 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0 0 0 It's grams per one mole of this. Okay, okay moles do all cancel out, so it does grams, but, but it's per one mole of the glucose. Okay. So if I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of glucose, I'm going to have 180 grams. But so that, this, is, this gives us a, a way you know, to know how many molecules. There's no way for me to count 6.02. 6.02 of the letter. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I can't count that many molecules, but I can go way out 180 grams. If I have 90 grams, that means I have a half a mole. Okay, so I, by knowing the grams and knowing this molar mass, it's a conversion factor. Anytime we have two units on something, it's a conversion factor between those two things. So our molar mass is always going to be our conversion factor between grams and moles. So if we know grams, we know moles. If we know moles, we know grams. If we know the molar mass. And by giving us the formula, then we can know the, the uh, molar mass always. So, just another example. This is under E. This is continuing an example here. What if we have something that's a little bit more complicated, something like... Um, we can even do 
that one. Al two SO four three. Y'all calculate the molar mass of that one. Y'all just do it in your notes. Al two SO four three. There is a periodic table on the inside cover of that book. Now, you don't have to put these moles and units in here, okay? So you can just say 6 times 12.01 plus. Okay, I was just kind of showing you how the units work out. But, so you don't have to put all that. You can if you want to. It's not wrong. If you want us to always go to the 100? Um, generally, at least three sig figs. Uh, you know, again, it all really depends upon how much is given, you know. to ask Miss Hatter about that shirt right there. Miss Bundren wore one on a, one of our work days. And, you know, because theoretically you're not supposed to show shoulders because they're, I guess, shoulders are sexy. And so, um, but it meets all the, it's got sleeves, it has the wide strap. And so Miss Bundren was asking if she was in dress code or not when she was wearing hers on the work day. And so, and then I had somebody in my AO, I talked about it, and they wore them the next day, and nobody said anything. So I don't to see a problem. I'm just curious on it. Everybody know what to do? Okay. Justin, what you get? I got 341.52. 341.52? Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, people are looking around kind of like. <laughs> All right. So, so that, maybe we ought to do it. 342.17. All right. So far we've heard about four answers, so let's do it. Okay. So it's obviously it's going to be two times aluminum, aluminum, okay, is 26.98. Okay. So if you use, now here, if you use 27.0, you're going to get slightly different, obviously. It's just going to be a matter of six no, fakes. I use four, six, and seven, nine, six. For two, two. Uh, okay. So it's 26.98. Well, I'm not even going to use units. Okay. Plus, how many? How many? I know. I'm going to put them on the end. Yes, sir. we use 27.0? No, that's fine. Again, you show your work and whatever, it's going to all come out fine. Okay. So how many sulfurs do I have? Three. So it's three times 32. Now again, is you either use 0.1 or you use the 0 0.07. And some of you overachievers might have used the 066, and I think I just said 07, 07. I'm on a mission from God to train myself. O is a letter, zero is a number. Okay? I used to say O, but then I'm trying to Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm about 80% efficient. Okay? You're allowed to hey, you're allowed to correct me as well. So if you catch me, okay. How many oxygens do I have? Twelve. Okay. So using this, y'all, come on, stay with me. Using this, what do we get? Three hundred forty-two point one seven. Now on this one, we just know molar mass is what unit. Grams per mole. You must put the unit on the final answer. Now, 
most of the time when we're doing like a stoichiometry problem or we're doing other problems, we're going to want to carry the units all the way through. But the molar mass is going to be such a common thing that this is one you don't even have to show your work on if you can just get to it. Okay? So this is, needs to be just something that is so instinctive and just so easy and so natural that we just go to it. We don't have to show work. Okay? So, uh, but we know always the unit on is grams per mole. And so that, that's, that's huge because when we're using it, which we're, we're going to look at. Okay? So I'm assuming now we're all good. We know how to do that. That's all. You did it a thousand times last year. This is just like we shook a little bit of dust off, so now we're for sure. All right. One special type. What if we have a hydrate, something like sodium carbonate dot 10 H2O? Okay. <laughs> this is called a hydrate. It's got, you did a lab last year with a blue, turned it to white with copper sulfate. We're going to do the same lab again this year um, in conjunction with a different one, kind of two for one on the same day. It's the second lab that we're going to do. Um, ideally, we're going to do a lab on Friday. Uh, our lab analysts have not come in yet, but we're still probably just going to do a density lab on Friday because the labs are filling up fast. Do you labs like every week? or? Like I try to, uh, at least every two weeks. Okay. Ideally, the, yeah, we're not going to be there every day, but our labs, our labs are labs, they're not some activities. Okay? And so they're going to be much more in depth. I said in the $25 for every student. Say about a lab coat, what? I said in the $25, we should all get a lab coat. No, 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 no. Hey, Miss Cannon, Miss Cannon's teaching AP Biology now. She made her students pay for the, the fancy lab manual that you guys are getting. So that was in addition, too. So um, just know that over half of your lab fee got used up in that lab manual. You pay $25, but all the chemicals and glassware and everything else cost a lot of money, too. Okay? 25, we're going to do a lab with silver nitrate. 25 grams of silver nitrate costs like $140. Oh, that's a lot of money. Okay, that's a lot of money. Okay, I just spent, I just spent by chemicals and, and supplies, I just spent uh, about $1,100. The, the gallon jug of peroxide is $105 just for, for that gallon jug of peroxide. Because that's what your lab fee is going to pay for. So when I do the uh, Elton toothpaste and, and do those demos, things are expensive. Okay, so this is a hydrate. Does anybody remember how you include the water on this one? Just find like the And then you add, you see, in math, the dot means multiply. But for us, the, here, what this means is that there's water trapped. So the sodium carbonate was precipitated from an aqueous solution, from a solution of water. Okay? So they evaporate the water off. The sodium carbonate then re recrystallizes, forms, forms the solid. But water gets trapped in the crystal. And it's crazy that it, in the crystal structure, because of the way the H plus, the H water, the oxygen, the negative side attaches to the positive, and the positive hydrogens attach to the negative carbonates, it forms this crystal. It always follows the law of definite composition, meaning it's always 10 waters for every Na2CO3, just the way the crystal forms. So hydrates follow the law of definite composition, but the water is not really part of it. It's not chemically bonded to it. It's just trapped in the crystal. So we could heat this up just to 100 degrees and make the water boil off and keep the sodium carbonate and be, make it become anhydrous sodium carbonate. So it's kind of weird, and then you include it in the molar mass, because if you went and weighed it, the water is there as part of it. But it's not really chemically bonded to it, it's just kind of trapped in the crystal. So it's called a hydrate, but we, so we add in the 10 waters. So this is going to be 2 times the sodium, which is 23, it will be 0 0.00, I, I usually go to 3 to 20, yeah, zero, zero. I know it's going to be 99, 9, 22.99. Right, nine, yes. Nine. Plus the 1 times 12.01 plus 3 times 16 plus, now y'all, water. What do we know the molar mass of water is going to be? 18. 18. 
Okay, but to, we're going to take it a little bit farther this year, and so it's going to be 18.02, because it's 1.01. Okay, so it's just going to be 10 times 18.02. I'm not even going to break that down into the hydrogens and the oxygens. There's no need to do that. We know water is 18.02. We can just throw that in there. Okay, so all that comes out to... Two hundred eighty-six point one nine. Do we? Does somebody agree with that? Yes. Okay. I, I, the reason I have to ask that is because last year I, I had a student. His name is going to remain anonymous. Okay, but he got the wrong number every time. <laughs> Very smart, knew what was going on, but every time he'd give me a number and then everybody said, no, that's not it. <laughs> so I always have to get two people to agree on a number. There's nothing worse than me going through and then being five minutes late. Mr. Hodge, I think back there it was supposed to be whatever. All right, so I'm always going to ask for two or three to agree to make sure that we're on the right place. So if you get something else, speak up. Because you guys can do calculus and pre-calculus and trig, but sometimes just plugging simple numbers into the calculator is above your pay grade. You guys struggle with that. All right, now, what we're going to work on, and I, but I just really kind of want to finish, I want to go through and do mixtures next, but we've got to come back then is, okay, well, how do we use this grams per mole then in the calculations, because that's the real thing, dimensional analysis and setting the units up and going through and doing that. But we're just going to finish up, talk about mixtures, then we'll come back and practice and really tomorrow is going to be a lot of a work day um, of just kind of practicing, going through and doing dimensional analysis, doing some density problems, because uh, we all know density is what's the, what over what? Density is, what, but what unit over what unit? It's, thank you, I'm looking for mass over volume, is that what you were saying? I didn't hear you guys speak up. All these guys are so loud. Mass over volume, and mass is measured in, I heard that this is where we take the units, grams. Volume is going to be measured in liters for gases, milliliters for solids and liquids, but another unit for milliliters, cubic centimeter. One cubic centimeter and one milliliter are the same. And we'll, we're going to, we're, that's our first lab is going to be density, and we'll really talk about that as we're doing the lab. Okay? Um, so, but a cubic centimeter is the same as a milliliter. So cubic centimeters is really going to be, it can work for solids and liquids. Milliliter really only works for liquids. We usually don't measure a solid in terms of milliliters. It's going to be more length times width times like cubic centimeter. All right. So let's do our last one. Now this is big three. Oh, I didn't mean to erase that. Oh well. Just look back at the video. <laughs> big three. Mixtures. What would you think of me a definition of a mixture? Two things mixed together, but how? What's the difference going to be between a mixture and a compound? Physical means, whereas a compound is chemical means, right? Okay? Physical means. Okay? So it's, it's a physical blend versus a chemical blend. Here in a compound, the elements chemically combine. They react. They form a new substance with new properties. But in a mixture, they just physically combine and retain their identities. Okay? So hydrogen and oxygen can mix in the air okay, and just be a mixture of two gases and hydrogen is still a gas, oxygen is still a gas. They still have their same characteristics of, of oxygen being good for us, hydrogen not really doing anything for us. Hydrogen means super light, the densities are different. But then if we strike a match and make them chemically combined, they form water. 
which is a whole new substance that's a liquid at room temperature, completely different characteristics than either the hydrogen or the oxygen. So they chemically combine to form a compound, whereas when they're just mixing together, it's a mixture. So it's a physical, that's the key word there, physical blend of two or more substances. Okay, so that means you could have two elements mixing, you could have two, mi two compounds mixing, you could have an element and a compound mixing. Those are your substances. Subs pure substance, either an element or a compound. A mixture is a physical blend of two or more substances. Okay? Now, we can have two types of mixtures. Homogeneous. That's an A. That's an A. Consistency. There we go. Homogeneous. Homo, it's really homogeneous, not genius. There's not an E in there. Homogeneous really is probably the better way to pronounce it. Okay? So, an even or let's say uniform, a uniform, sorry, a uniform mixture with only one phase, okay? In other words, it's the same throughout. So if you look at Kool-Aid, you know, you got red fruit punch Kool-Aid, it's red at the top, it's red at the bottom, it's red all the way through, you have a single phase, you don't have different parts with different properties, it's all uniform, okay? Whereas, heterogeneous, heterogeneous, erogenous, is a mixture with different parts with different properties. <laughs> Paul, did I say something wrong? Mixture with different, or with different, oh. I got problems. Okay, a mixture, I was thinking, I was thinking, oh, I do A mixture with different properties, different parts. parts. With different Oh, that's what I did, I forgot parts. Parts are parts. <laughs> with different properties. Multi-phase. Okay? Chicken noodle soup. You got the noodles. You got the chicken parts. You got the grease sitting on top. You got the liquid in the oven. You got all, you can see the different parts. If you have granite countertops, you can see all the different specks and whatever in the granite. All right? Um, muddy water. Cereal. Cereal. Okay. Oil and water, Italian salad dressing, anything that you can see the different parts is heterogeneous. Okay? Yeah. So, with the two different mixtures. Now, they can be separated. We need to talk about this separated. I had those all pulled up the other day. Now I don't know. By physical means. Okay? And, and now... Now we're I. There are three me physical means in which we really want to separate things. Now, there's the obvious is you can just pull them apart. If, if like they're multi different color or whatever, you can just separate by hand. Okay? But three common laboratory means of separating. And the first one is the one we're going to do the most often is filtration. Filtration. And a lot of times, in terms of stoichiometry, we'll call this a gravimetric, a gravimetric method, because you're going to use gravity to separate and pull the liquid down, and it's going to stay in the funnel. Okay? And we know that if I take a piece of filter paper, and I have to get it into the funnel. Okay? So I want to filter something. I got to get this round filter paper into this funnel. Cut it. Justin, you fold it. 
Okay, so watch now, no long sleeves, the hand is quicker than the eye. Okay, we fold it in half. Now we have a semicircle. Okay, fold it in half again. Now we have a quadrant. A qu you have one, two, three, four pieces of paper now. Take three of those four. Squeeze. Voila. We have a funnel. Now, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's a miracle of science. But now, notice how this tends to want to pop out of here. So what we do is we use the fact that water is very sticky. The fact that water has strong hydrogen bonds. And we just can put a couple of drops of water. And now, it will stick to the sides. And so you have it ready to go to do your filtering. Wow. <laughs> hydrogen bonds are your friend. We don't, we don't think about this, but water is very sticky. Okay? Which is why if you have to clean the counter, you got to clean the dirt off something, a paper towel will just kind of push it. But if you really want it, you wet the towel, and then everything sticks to the paper towel. <laughs> okay? Because water is sticky, because of the hydrogen bonding in water, water tends to stick to everything. So if you want to clean something, you get it wet, so the water will stick to it. Okay? So it's sticking to the sides here because and the hydrogen bonds are an amazing, wonderful thing. Okay? So, filtration. And you guys have did a lot of filtration, I think, with Graber. We're going to do a lot. We're going to do, it's going to be cool for us, is that we're going to use vacuum filtration to speed it up. So if you run water through a tube, there's actually a lower pressure inside the tube. Here's, this is fun to say. The faster a fluid flows, the faster a fluid flows through a tube, the lower the pressure. That's Bernoulli's principle. Okay? And so in the, in the labs, you'll see that we have the little aspirators hooked up to the sink with the little, um, Post sticking out of the side. And so as you turn that on, it creates a, a low pressure on the inside, so it creates suction. So you can hook up a hose to this, and we're going to have a special Erlenmeyer flask that has a, 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 a neck a, a, a post on it as well. And so then you can create suction, and so it pulls the water through rather than just letting gravity pull it through. So it speeds up the filtration very, very rapidly. Uh, it doesn't speed it up rapidly. It makes it very rapid. It speeds it up a lot. Okay? So, filtration is a very common, that's a physical means of separating though. Because now you still have the solid, you still have the liquid, you're separating the two. Okay? The second means... I got, I got the neon, right? Yeah, I, got, I get the neon. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> ten till for those of you. Okay, ten till. Okay. Have y'all figured that clock out yet? Are you looking? Yeah. Yeah, that was Raven's class because I'm always playing out <laughs> But now you don't look at it at all because you just want to stay in here all day long. Okay. So the second means is what I have here is distillation. Okay? Distillation. Distilled water. <laughs> Follow me. Hello. Okay. How do you distill something? You purify. You just, just purify. You boil it. Okay? But if you put water in a pot and you boil it, you're not really getting distilled water. You need to boil it for a so I just kind of get the germs out of it just by boiling in the pot? Yeah. You know? Now see, that's, 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 that's something different if you do that. See, that's what the priest does, okay, to make, to get the holy water, okay? You just get a pot, you put it on the, 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 the sacred stove, and then you just turn the heat up and just boil the hell out of it. And so that makes holy water. I'm here all day. I'm, I'm sorry. That's just a joke, y'all. I'm not trying to say it. 
Hey guys, Josh is getting back to the real deal here. You can't relish the humor just for a second. Okay. All right. So that's exactly right. So we're going to boil it. Okay. We're going to boil it. So you put your impure water here. Okay. You heat it up and boil it. Now what's going to happen here, this is a condensing tube. So there's a tube inside the tube. So water, you got to do this by a sink because you hook it up to the hose at, at the sink right there to here. And that makes cold water rush around the inside tube. And then you have this one going back to the sink. So water, and you make it run uphill so it fills up. If you make it go here this way, it just runs along the bottom and it doesn't completely surround the tube. Okay? So you make it run uphill so you have cold water doing this. So the steam is coming here. A lot of times you can put a, a cork with a thermometer if you want to just adjust the temperature. Um, get it just right so you can control it so you can have a, a thermometer down into here or like just I have it sealed. So the steam comes up here but then the cold water it's running through the inside tube and the cold water is running on the outside and so that then causes the steam to condense and it comes here. Okay, So now you're getting just pure water on this side. So you're distilling the water. Okay, Now salt, ionic compounds, they have very high melting and boiling points. So they're staying behind in here. You're heating up. The water is held together by the weak intermolecular force. We just talked about hydrogen bonds. As cool as they are, they're still weak compared to an ionic bond or a covalent bond. So the water molecule doesn't break apart. Steam, by the way, is not hydrogen and oxygen. Steam is what? It's, it's water vapor. It's still water molecules. It's just in the gaseous form. Okay. So the, the impurities stay behind because they have a much, much, much higher boiling point. So they're not boiling or anything. They're still really wanting to be solids at room temperature. They're just broken apart. So the steam comes up here, comes here, so we collect the pure distilled water over here. Over here. <laughs> over here. I, I, I got to get my tongue back in shape for talking like this. Uh, you know, summer off. Um, so, where else have we heard this term for distilling? I heard somebody in the back. Wesley, what you did? What you just say? That, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, moonshine. No, I heard moonshine. Did you not say moonshine? Uh, I was good. Uh, sorry, it was over here. Okay. Moonshine. Okay. If you ever watch the show Moonshiners, sorry. So I heard it come from this side. I thought it was you. Okay. And, and just for the record, anytime I turn sideways and look at the profile, I just feel an urge to kind of suck in a little bit. Um, so, moonshine. He said moonshine, okay? I thought it came from here. I saw his mouth move, and I heard moonshine, okay? All right, come on. Come on. Here we go. Now I gotta get y'all back. <laughs> Woo! Here we go. Moonshine. Just talking about it. Get y'all a little giddy here. If you ever watch the show Moonshiners, okay, they have the still. Okay, the still out in the out in the woods, hiding from the cops. Okay, so the still is this distillation. A lot of times they do it. They they find a place out in the woods by a creek because they need a water supply. Or, a lot of times you'll just see the copper coils. So rather than being water cooled, they just do air cooled. So they do a copper coil, and so they get a lot of surface area, so that the air will just cool and cause the, not water vapor, but they want the alcohol vapor to be able to condense. So you make moonshine by taking some kind of corn, something that has starch or sugar in it, and then you put some yeast with it and let it sit over time and it's just naturally going to ferment. The yeast is going to cause the sugar to turn into an alcohol. Why is it illegal? Is it just because it's dangerous? Be because it's dangerous because number one, if you're not careful and you don't do it right, that you can make methanol instead of ethanol. Ethanol is called grain or corn or grain alcohol. Okay. Methanol is called wood alcohol, just common names. 
Methanol, just 10 milliliters of methanol will make you go blind. Okay? Much more than that will kill you. So it's very dangerous. Plus, the government wants to tax it. Okay? But it's, it's, it's for safety. You're actually allowed to make it for your own personal use. Here in Alabama especially, you're allowed to brew beer. You're allowed to make wine. You're allowed to brew your own stuff. You know, but you just can't sell it. All right? So... Um, so you get this mixture, though, of your, of your corn or your sugar or whatever you put in there to ferment. The yeast is kind of nasty, okay, in there, and you mix it with water, and they, they cook it for a while, and they heat it up, and let it just kind of, then they have to let it sit for a couple of weeks. Then once they, they feel like it's ready, then they have to distill it. They, they have to use their still. So they have these big copper pots that they're brewing in, and they heat it up, and then they have an a apparatus Generally, it's going to be a coil of copper, okay? And then they're just going to have their, their jugs over here that they're going to collect it in, okay? And so it comes through. Now, so what we, they want, alcohol boils at 78 degrees Celsius, water's at 100 degrees. So they're going to have a, a temperature in here, a thermometer, to where they're going to control that. You want to have the solution right around 80 degrees. So the alcohol is boiling but then you're not getting as much water coming across. And so you're gonna distill it, and it's gonna become over here as far as moonshine, but you're still gonna have some water because at 80 degrees, the water is gonna be evaporating. So moonshiners, they just gonna take this, don't knock it over. Moonshiners gonna take this, probably just first run, and just kind of sell it. Now the difference between cheap Russian vodka and top shelf vodka is how many times do they distill it? How many times do they go through the process of removing the water and purifying it and getting just the alcohol versus the, the mixture of alcohol and water? You know, the more times you distill it, the more pure it gets and the better and more expensive it's gonna be because it, it takes more effort, okay? And so, and I saw that on Mythbusters, I don't know that from experience, okay? <laughs> and so, um, Going through and, and, and just so that's that's the process though of doing that and, and you guys know that that was the birth of NASCAR um, is that the moonshiners were trying to build fast cars to be able to outrun the cops you know you know you know and so yeah during prohibition you know <laughs> you guys all y'all thought that that <laughs> that came from here in Alabama you just go hey that's a nice car. That's a nice car. You want to race? You know, but that's not working. Yeah. That's so dis distillation. Now listen, when you go to the grocery store, you go to the bottle the, the bottled water, the jugs, the plastic jugs, the milk jugs full of water. You can either get spring water or distilled water. Sometimes they even just call it purified, but you, get, you need to make sure if you want truly distilled water, which is pure water, you have to, you know, get the distilled jugs. There's, there's like three different types in that water area. Doesn't distilled water taste better? Yeah, it has no flavor to it whatsoever, yeah. And so most of the time, the drinking water or purified water, they add a few little, a, a small amount of uh, salts to it, different, different ions just to give it a little bit of flavor and to kind of help um, make it last longer. And so really for your body's sake, you need um, a little bit of the salts in there. Otherwise, if you drink pure water, it tends to leach the salts out of your cells uh, by osmosis, which you guys maybe learned in biology, we'll talk about in solutions. Osmosis, osmosis. Okay, the third one, the third one is with chromatography. Now, chromatography. Chromatography is just separating substances based upon their different characteristics. Okay? Well, actually, let me backtrack before I even get into that. And I'm not going to write anything else down, but I just made, that made me just think of something. Um, oil companies use distillation to, as the first step in refining oil but it's called fractional distillation. And instead of having something like this, they have a, they'll have this, but then they'll have a big column 
coming up off of, I mean, I mean, they're like 10, 15, 20 stories tall, these big fractional distillation plates. So they, they bring the raw crude oil, that's a mixture of all kinds of hydrocarbons in the crude oil. They'll bring it in, they heat it up, and then they have, at different heights, they have the different um, streams coming off of it. The heavier, the, 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 the longer the hydrocarbon chain is, the low, pardon me, the higher the boiling point is going to be. Okay? The small ones, the, the C, CH4, C2H6, all the smaller chains, they evaporate very quickly, very easily. So they'll go way up to the top. But the heavier ones are going to come off the bottom. So they can, they, they, based upon the temperature, they can fractionalize, they can break the oil into five different components right off the bat just by heating it up, by having what's called fractional distillation, so by the difference in the boiling points. And that's how oil um, gets re the first step of the refining process of oil. So in Baton Rouge, uh, they have uh, these Exxon, they have like 10 of them all around, just right there at the big refinery they have. They're probably all underwater right now, but um, it's really <laughs> sad. I mean, my home church uh, in Baton Rouge, I lived there for 23 years. The home church that I worked at when I was in, in between years in college and stuff, it had five feet of water in the, in the sanctuary. I mean, it was just unbelievable how much water there was. Anyway, so that's just another type. So distillation, sometimes you can have fractional. You can have these columns where they just break it off in there. Okay, so chromatography kind of uses the same thing, is that they can separate substances into the different parts, but it's more based upon the properties, generally the polar and nonpolar properties, okay? You, you guys remember that, and we'll learn, we'll talk about that more later on in the semester. But we know like dissolves like. Polar dissolves polar. Nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. Yes, that rings bells. No? Okay. So that's like the difference between a, a latex paint and an oil-based paint. A latex paint you can clean up with water, but an oil-based paint you have to have mineral spirits or paint thinner, okay? because of the difference, because a water-based versus an oil-based, a polar versus a non-polar. Well, different things, so if, if you put a mixture of something uh, into, and I'm going to show you a video of this, you put it in there, if, if you have a polar solvent and it's rising up a piece of paper, well, things that are polar are going to rise with the water. Things that are non-polar aren't going to be attracted to the water. They're just going to maybe stay on the bottom of the paper. If you reverse it, if you put a nonpolar solvent in the bottom, then the nonpolar solutes things are going to rise up with the solvent, and the polar things are going to stay at the bottom. And that's called paper chromatography. Did you do that in biology at all, paper chromatography? Did any of y'all watch NCIS? Yeah. Okay, with Abby? Yeah. Okay. And she's got a machine. She has kernel mass spec. Okay. That mass spec is really a GCMS, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Now, we already read about the mass spectrometer part. It identifies the compounds based upon its mass. Well, the gas chromatograph is gas chromatography. As they shoot a gas in, it's got this resin, and based upon how much the molecules are attracted to that resin determines how fast they can make it through the tube. So it's a tube with this resin that's like this. So it goes through. So the ones that are highly attracted to it go through slowly. The ones that aren't attracted to it go through fast. So it separates the, the mixture into its different components as it comes out. Then the mass spec identifies what each component is as it comes out. And so it, it's, it's a very common uh, instrument used in and just about any industry that has anything to do with chemicals at all uses a GCMS, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. It's a separation. Let's just see now. Let's just watch this video if I can find it. I had it already yesterday. I think I put it in a bookmark. Okay. 
Sounds pretty fast. Now, y'all, you do need to know we are not going to do this lab. There was actually a question on last year's AP test. I never really talked about paper chromatography because nobody ever used it anymore because it's so antiquated. But there was a question on last year's test, so I'm just going to throw this five minutes out there for you. Hey, go ahead, pause. Ava, go ahead, pause on that, please. Why is this not coming on? Yeah, yeah, I'm not ready. Just, just pause it for now. But yeah, we're going to start over. If I can make my projector come on. Huh? But I didn't hear the beat, and I don't see the light in the front. Truck. I need a tall guy. I'm not talking. Just come on. You can stand on a chair right here. I know. I let Joseph stand on your chair. Okay. I want you to just manually turn this off. I think that's the power button right there. Okay. So push the button. I can't get chair. So I just want you to manually turn it on. That one right there. Now hold it. You don't have to hold it. You stupid person. So it won't turn off at all? I think you're totally frozen no, up. Okay, on plug and power. There you are. Okay. There you Sorry about that. He wouldn't do that. I used to restroom. There we go. Uh, can you not wait five minutes? Okay. All right, now it's coming on. Sorry. What? Uh, <laughs> I'm over here. <laughs> I can too. <laughs> yeah, I needed to kind of watch the video. Okay, now hey, now we can start it. And we should have sound. I think the sound's gonna be on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you draw a line, so that's your that's your marker. You draw the line with the marker. Okay? I don't know. Turn, can we turn it to five? Wow. Well, you really don't even need the sound, don't worry about sound. So you can just see now this is 16 times. So this is water down here. And it's just a marker, and it's just bringing this up. I don't know what I'm supposed to subscribe to, but, okay? And so the different colors are separating out. Some are heavier, some are lighter, some are more solid running water, some are less. Because of these different properties, all of the different colors are going to travel at different speeds. And uh, by the completion of our experiment, we should see some very nice separation. Okay, so that's just a... a, a um, what do you call those markers? Yeah, so uh, these 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 what yeah. we're going to want to do is to measure the distance traveled by each pigment. Let's pause here for a moment. Uh, so we want to measure the maximum distance traveled by the water, and then by each different pigment, starting at the line drawn on the paper. To be fair, we should be comparing the distance traveled by the water, starting from the same point where the pigment started traveling. So we'll measure all of our distances starting at this point. Uh, it looks like the maximum distance traveled by the water reaches about here. Seven centimeters. We measure the maximum distance traveled by each of the different pigments. 
So you're going to calculate the RF factor. So the RF is just the distance traveled by the pigment divided by the total distance. So with however far each color went, divided by 7. That's called your RF. It's just how far did the solvent go completely on the bottom by how far did the, each color go on top. That's your RF factor. And then you can use that in chromatography to help identify the substances and things. Okay? So that's paper chromatography. Now, uh, go ahead and stop it, please. So, if we use, a, that was water. So that means that the things that's on the top is the most polar. It's attracted to the water the most, and so it traveled up highest. Okay? The things that are on the bottom were more attracted to the paper than they were to the water. If we reverse the type of solvent, then the nonpolar things, the things that are attracted to the nonpolar would rise to the top, and usually you have a different type of uh, paper or a different type of chromatography paper to where uh, it's going to stick more to the bottom. So it's going to be light dissolves like the higher up it goes, the more attracted it is to the solvent. That's one of the most important things for you to know. This should be a bell ring at 10 till, so we still got two minutes. Yeah, it looks like you're pretty serious here. So. Okay. I know, but we went. All right, we're coming back from lunch. No, uh, there's a reason. All right. All right. So, don't explain. Don't explain. Don't explain. Okay, so. So, listen. Listen now. So, we've talked about our three classes of matter. Elements, compounds, and mixtures. Talked about the basic characteristics of each one of those. The separation is real important as far as mixtures are concerned, knowing how each type of separation works. That is an important AP concept. Calculating the molar mass of our substances is one of the most important things. If you read in chapters one and two are the two main chapters, we're touching on different parts in three, okay? And then I'm gonna kind of do the rest of three on its own. Another area that we haven't talked about, but I think is so basic, are physical and chemical properties and physical and chemical changes. Okay, so you might want to just br browse over that and look at those things as far as the differences. Tomorrow we're going to be working on mainly, we're going to spend mostly a work day uh, going over and looking at some of those things, doing dimensional analysis, looking at the metric system, doing just some conversions with that. Um, and so it's pr pretty much bring, make sure you bring your calculators tomorrow. Uh, you probably want to bring your Chromebooks for sure tomorrow because we can that way we can all do the same problems you know in the Chromebook. Okay? Friday we're gonna do our first lab. It's gonna be a density lab. We'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow as well, and then I'll send out the remind uh, and we'll talk about what you have to wear. You go straight to AO, okay? They're gonna call you to your juniors are gonna be in the lower gym, competition gym. Oh, you don't know who they are. I'm going to go to the next one.